coaching and mentoring? Yeah. Who needs it? It is a question that begs, and I have attempted to put together a few pertinent ideas that seek to convince that mentorship and coaching can be successfully used to assist new teachers. But I will go further and highlight why even the old horses also need mentoring and coaching. <laughs> I'm going to give a very brief overview of why we are we find ourselves here 20 years later. And then I'll glean a few excerpts from one or two researches just to prop the analysis that I'm going to make here. In the bulk of my presentation, I will offer some anecdotal insights into what mentoring has done to me personally. In as much as it is not empirical, hard data evidence, it is still evidence that mentoring and coaching does impact one another, has impact in, in this course. I hardly need to remind any one of us about the new South Africa that was ushered in in 1994. It was a new South Africa that emerged from a grim past of carefully orchestrated segregation in every sphere of life, education included. Professor Fleisch of the University of Edfatter's Friend said in one of his papers, this is the legacy that Henrik Fairford bequeathed to South Africa. For 50 years, apartheid education has been deliberately designed to privilege whites and disadvantage black South Africans in every aspect, from the training of teachers to the very buildings that the school occupied. Now, I just want us to hold in mind the issue of from the training of teachers, because I'm going to allude that a little later on. At independence, the whole social, political, economic system was necessarily overhauled to meet the demands of a new society and redress the imbalances that had been artificially created by an oppressive system. Along with the rest of the changes were reforms in education. The educational system has metamorphosed dramatically in policy and curriculum, methodologies and implementation, resourcing, etc. Now, all those changes are intimidating, especially to the classroom practitioner, more so the new teacher who is charged with directly implementing the curriculum and is affected by policy. Now, indeed, the teacher is at real risk of getting buried underneath the rubble of the earthquake that shook the whole education system at independence. It is the teacher who has to deal with an ever-changing curriculum, quick set policies, under-resourced circumstances, under-supportive, and even at times, blatantly unsupportive management, and cooperative peers and workmates, and rural learners, Tons of documentation, personal inadequacy to deliver the subject content, which is not fault of their own. The list is infinite. We could go on and on. Now add to that their own personal social pressures, and you have a teacher who is always on auto mode. <laughs> Teachers have become dispassionate, they have become cold, mechanical in what they do. Now, in previous dialogues, speakers highlighted the extremes in which teachers operate. Dismal remuneration, low levels of empowerment, you name it. Teachers are daunted and demotivated and everything, by everything around them. They live in denial and look for someone else to blame. Yeah. Anyone else but themselves. <laughs> it's never been. You go this week, you're told, ah, Tim, these students. <laughs> These ones. Ah. <laughs> then you get there the next day, the next week is the SMT. <laughs> they never support us. Never. I ask for cookies, I don't get them. <laughs> Come on, guys. Cookies cost 10 rand they pick and pay. And then the next week is the HOD. And then the next week is the sports program. Yeah. We were busy with sports, eh, you know. <laughs> the list goes on and on. Now, I have never before heard the word stress mentioned so numerously as when I visited schools. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I am stressed. I'm stressed. In fact, the saddest thing is that too many of our teachers are already retired and resigned emotionally. They are in the schools, but in their minds, they are not there. They have either retired or they have, either, or they have resigned. Contributors to an earlier discussion rightfully noted that even our good teachers are becoming tired and demotivated. Mm -hmm. Now it makes me think of the shutdown command on your computer. Mm -hmm. The moment you hit shut, shut, then it blinks down. No matter how frantically you tap on the keys, it won't resuscitate. <laughs> because you may see the lights blinking, but all it is doing is shutting down business of the day. So this is pretty much what is happening now in our schools. Teachers are in shutdown mode. You can still see the lights blinking. <laughs> but you cannot sit back and blame the teachers. We cannot afford to let what is be because it is our children who suffer ultimately. And it is at this point that we need to intervene. It would be folly for us to think that teachers will get the ropes of the game and learn on their own from experience. They might, but at the expense of our children. Meanwhile, it is okay for someone to make mistakes and learn from them, but it is just easier to learn from someone else's mistake. In this case, the mentor, the coach, who is maturated in the profession. And in any case, our mistakes, and read that as the teacher's mistake, we are all teachers, are the most embarrassing mistakes. I remember the job that used to do the rounds. To me, it wasn't a job. That the mistakes of a doctor are six feet under. The mistakes of a lawyer safely behind bars. <laughs> but the mistake of a teacher are walking up and down the street. <laughs> they are our failures. Grim reminders, they become tortsies, rapists, drunkards, drug addicts, our failures. Now, mentoring and coaching is a relatively new concept in the South African educational context. It might still be viewed abstemiously in some quarters, but I believe that for several reasons, it remains one of the most plausible interventions open to us. Mentoring has worked well in other fields, in other countries, very well. Literature will tell you that from the times of mentor in the ethical stall of King Odysseus and his son Telemachus, to medical hospitals in the United States of America, the war fields in Vietnam, industry, in commerce, all those other spheres of our lives have been affected by mentoring and coaching, except in education. So it should work in our own context. I believe it works. It has worked for me. I've already cited the very difficult circumstances for teachers, and they can surely do with a shoulder to lean on. As a mentor, one can move in to inspire a teacher to move on. The new teacher almost always come to the first day of school full of zest. They are excited at the prospect of making a mark on the children, the community, and the world. I remember it very well myself. I'm sure you all do. Your first day you walk into class, you say, fresh from college, fresh from varsity. Yeah, I'm coming in, I want to make a mark. But that feeling doesn't last. <laughs> Very soon the new teacher faces the reality that college and university theories are just that, theories. <laughs> Far removed from the giggly girl in the corner, the sounding bully at the back, <laughs> The classroom is bursting on its seams and the poor teacher has two books to go around the learners. And somehow the siren seems to go off at the most inconvenient of times before the lesson actually starts. And before she knows it, the SMT wants this document, submit that. <laughs> now, a mentor comes in as an invaluable aid in a situation like this, helping to ease the pressure by nudging the new teachers to maximize their potential in terms of planning, methodology, and management. 
without, of course, stifling their autonomous functionality. Mm. As a coach, you don't want to impose yourself on the teacher. Mm. They must still function in their own mm. personal identity. Now, Paul called this the chief executive of the Federation of Governing Bodies of South Africa, quoting the famous McKinsey report, said two things. One, the quality of education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And two, the way to improve outcomes is to improve instruction. Then he went on to say one of the most important phrases. Oh, so he said three things actually. Change the mindset of our 400,000 teachers. That to me is the most urgent need. No makanja, no matter what. I mean, let's do whatever it takes for us to change the mindset of the teacher in the classroom. I don't know, shackle them to, to, to the desk in the classroom. Give them 50,000 rand a month. Give them a car on top. Whatever we do. Let's motivate them to want to teach again. I cannot promise, of course, that all these material things would change things. It is about attitudinal change in the mind. I have to, I've had to take many new teachers, and here I'm using new very conservatively. Because, like I mentioned earlier, even the old horses, to me, were also new through crash programs of how to. Now, in the wake of near disaster teaching practices, not that I was better than any of them, but just because I was a bit more seasoned and understood a few more fundamentals in the real classroom. It is a lot like passing your learners and your driver's license, it is far removed from driving on the road <laughs> because in your learners. Or you know, when you do go for your red test, you are protected by all the signs around you to say, please be cautious, learn a drive. But on the road, a mentor could facilitate in unpacking and making sense of the hundreds of complex of documents and requirements. The top caps document, for instance, which apparently still baffles some of the most seasoned teachers. These are seldom part of a university teacher program, or if they are, they are treated very carefully. A new teacher needs a confidante. Workplaces are notoriously unkind to newcomers, who are often left to fend for their own. If they do not have the support of a mentor who can help them in finding solutions to their pedagogical problems, then they are left to wither. I quite often had to deal with new teachers who say to me that on their first day they were offered a chair in the staff room, a stack of teacher guides and pens, a box of chalk and a duster shown to their classroom. <laughs> One could very easily give up in the absence of a friend who can take your hand. Remember the song from Dolly Parton, Take My Hand and Walk With Me. <laughs> Mentorship is built on firm pillars of absolute trust. You become a personal counselor and friend. Our teachers are human, let's take it. They come from communities and societies that are riddled with all the ills as yours and mine. Everything else that impacts you and me impacts them too. When they get into the classroom, they have come from a violent night at home, a sick wife, a sick husband, a sick child. They have also passed through the toll gates. <laughs> On a red tank. <laughs> now I could go on and on. But suffice it to say that the case of the boss who scolded the scolded my father, who scolded my mother, who scolded my brother, who kicked the cat, who kicked the dog, the cat dog that beat the cat, it goes down, it ripples down to to our little lens. A socially drained teacher is an ineffective teacher. I remember the glowing faces of some of the teachers that I mentored when they saw me arrive at the school. The relief was tangible. They would offload their burdens before going to class. I could only imagine what would have happened if I had not visited on that particular day. I became the aunt. I became the malumen because the aunts are down in KwaZulu-Natal to solve their personal issues. 
Now, as a mentor, you need to do that. As a direct consequence of the mentoring intervention, I witnessed fantastic changes in the schools, in the classrooms with our learners. I can confidently say that I changed attitudes, I changed perceptions, I changed mindsets. And when I say I, I don't mean I personally. I mean all the coaches who went out into the schools under the GPLMS project made an impact. Teachers who had previously avoided teaching some content areas yeah. became more confident. Enough to go out and teach them. Many had shunned writing, reading, now go to the schools and witness for yourselves. Morale has, was significantly higher. When I started off, HODs complained that teachers did not want to join the English department. They said that there was too much work. But by the time I came out of the schools, teachers were booking to get into the English department at the start of the new year. Understanding of subject matter and methodology was substantially higher than before the start of the mentoring process. Teachers were able to speak and argue more confidently in linguistic matters, in grammar, in literature. Management skills improved dramatically. Classrooms changed now to lesson and resource management. Skills were ameliorated. But the overall impact, I'm glad to say, benefited our most valuable variable in the matrix, our ultimate target, the learner. This is discernible from statistics from internal assessments and the annual national assessment. Learners are now excited to read and write. That is a good indication. They improved their problem-solving techniques and got more marks in comprehension and spelling. That is a good start. Statistical evidence is available to beg all that I'm saying to you now. I just didn't want to bore you with all the graphs, charts, and, and pie charts and stuff. I raised my case. <laughs>